Welcome everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Donna Chow and I'm your host and moderator for today's class by eLotus, your leading provider of TCM continuing education. We have been hosting edu educational courses for over two decades and we are proud to be your trusted source for premium CU content. With over 200 speakers, 700 courses, and 3,000 hours of continuing education. Today's webinar is Fundamentals of Trigger Point Needling and Neck Pain presented by Dr. Michael Sakowicz. Before we begin, let's do a little housekeeping. Today's webinar will be from 9 to 6 p.m. Pacific Time and we will have four breaks. Our lunch time will be from 1 to 2 p.m. If you guys have not done so already, please get your copy of the lecture notes from the Blue Course Access page in your account. If you'd like to join the chat, please do the following right now and set your chat preference to everyone so that everyone can see what you're typing. You'll have to do this manually because by default, the setting only allows the speaker and staff to see what you're typing. If you have any questions during our presentation today for Michael, please type them directly into the Q&A box from your Zoom control panel. Michael will answer your questions as time allows. The quiz and video replay will both be available tomorrow and you will receive an email notification when they are ready. All right guys, our speaker today is Michael Sackwich, who has been a practitioner of acupuncture and herbal medicine for almost 20 years. After graduating from Southwest Acupuncture College, he trained in orthopedics and rehabilitation at Tri-State Acupuncture College. The training addressed a variety of needle techniques aimed at assisting the body in recovering from pain. And among them is a, is a needle technique that is quite similar to what we know here in the West as dry needling. Michael has been actively involved in trigger point needling since that time, assisting a large number of people in overcoming acute and chronic pain. All right, Michael, go ahead and please take over, be, take over the screen now and share your PowerPoint. Hurrah. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Sam. And welcome. Good morning. And thanks, Donna, for the uh, wonderful introduction. Happy to be here. And we have a lot to talk about. i um, excited to, uh, you know, share all this stuff in a larger format. Um, so we don't really have to rush. We can really talk about um, the in depth about, you know, all this wonderful information and um, take a deep dive. So let's get into it. So as was said earlier, I went to SWAC in Tri-State. Um, when I was at SWAC, I had a uh, really great, um, not only some really great mentors, um, but great classmates too. Um, one was Andrew Nugent Head, who, uh, if any, if you know him, he uh, he spent a lot of time in China, and really digging deep into uh, tradition, like really old traditional Chinese medicine. And so it was really uh, a unique experience to be in class and sit next to him, and you know, while the teacher was presenting going, oh, but this is the deeper idea of what that is, or, you know, it was, it, it gave me a, a closer look into sometimes why we, you know, like what the classics were saying and how things get diluted into, you know, how we think of things now when we read, you know, uh, certain texts. Um, but anyway, that was a really unique experience. And I, I've learned, you know, a lot of these needle techniques through him. Um, and so that was really great. Um, but further on in life, you know, I had, uh, you know, when I lived in Boulder for many years, you know, Colorado and, um, there was a lot of, I saw a lot of sports acupuncture there. I saw a lot of yoga injuries. Um, I did that for quite a while, you know, um, and after that, I moved to uh, Providence and I worked in a clinic there and we saw a lot of internal medicine. So at that time, um, 
the internal medicine stuff really took over and I didn't really do much trigger point needling. Um, even though it was, it was a fairly fresh in my mind when I had moved there, um, I'd only been doing it for a few years. And then, so to go from that to doing almost all internal medicine, um, <laughs> that was a def definite step in a different direction. We did a lot of, you know, meridian balancing type, you know, Japanese style acupuncture. Um, and just had a really great experience there as far as learning how, um, how to manage patients, um, because that is really important uh, for us to be successful, um, not only for ourselves, but also you know, have to have success with patients and get you know, better recovery from, uh, for these individuals, right? Um, so that was really helpful to, to get on track with, with understanding that. Um, after that, I moved, I'm moving around a lot. I moved to, uh, to Atlanta, Georgia, where I'm at now. Um, and here I would say that, uh, I moved into a clinic that does primarily, uh, pain medicine. Um, the, uh, gentleman that has been running that, uh, place for, you know, the past 20 years or so. He, uh, you know, he's been doing, you know, a mix of acupuncture and, uh, you know, trigger point release technique. Um, and so it was just a really nice fit for me to go in there. So, you know, currently I probably see 70% um, of uh, my patients there are pain related. And I'm not doing necessarily trigger point uh, work with every single one of them. Um, you know, there's cases where uh, there's just a lot of hypersensitivity, uh, maybe some fibromyalgia type things, um, uh, things where there's just really sensitive. So you can't really do um, as deep of work. Um, and some people are just sensitive to this stuff, you know, as, as we'll talk about, in, you know, as we get going here. Um, and the other parts of, you know, in uh, practice is, let's say the other 30%, it's a lot of, you know, sleep disturbance, anxiety. Um, I think that the, uh, since the pandemic and um, all that has transpired there, you know, the amount of people with just, uh, you know, anxiety, depression, sleep disturbances, um, that's really gone up and it's, it's really been a, a big part of, of our practice. And even with our pain patients, you know, it's, we still have to work with that, you know, um, because, you know, uh, being in pain can cause a lot of emotional disturbance as well. Um, one story that I like to really kind of, that helps me set this apart is when I was doing all this uh, training in this work, I um, I was in Denver and I was treating patients in Denver. I had this one guy and I was doing acupuncture, moxibustion. Um, he had some very chronic knee pain and uh, very stubborn. No matter what I did, it would, you know, feel good for a few days and then it would come right back. And I treated him pretty regularly for, let's say, you know, six weeks or so. After that, I, uh, you know, I, I started learning some of these trigger point stuff. So I came back and I said, Hey, let's try this thing out. So I hit him in, uh, basically got vastus medius to release, you know, medial quad type stuff. And I got, a, I got a few good releases in there. And, um, you know, suddenly, you know, next week he came back and his pain was marked, markedly better you know, his, he had improved uh, a lot. And then after two, three more treatments, you know, I, he, I didn't see him again. So, um, he was just better and it's great. And so my point is, is, we can get more profound results with this type of work. Um, it's rehabilitative. It's, it's a little bit deeper. 
Um, but you have to, you know, you have to get through it. Um, and getting through it is there's sometimes a trick to that. So goals for today. We want to figure out, you know, trigger point identification, how patient skills, patient management, um, good techniques when we're needling, confidence in the entire process and skills to build upon. Um, I would like to say that this type of work, um, for some people, it's going to come very naturally. Uh, and for some people, it's not. And it's um, a really simple thing to kind of get, you know, really dig your claws into and start getting results very quickly. Um, so it's sort of easy in a way, but, you know, kind of getting to that next level of, of, you know, mastery, if you will, you know, um, it's, it's gonna, it's good. That takes time. Um, and a lot of it, it does take a lot of, um, practice and understanding um, mus muscle systems and fascial systems, because all of this uh, goes together. This is um, not only are, are we looking at, you know, the muscular systems uh, and fascial systems, we're also taking away what we've learned from um, our Chinese medical backgrounds, right? Because meridian therapy is also very powerful um, and I do use a combination of, of all these techniques with my patients. Um, and, you know, one thing is we're always learning, right? Uh, I, had a, I had a really interesting patient yesterday. She came in, I've been seeing her for a little while, um, maybe four visits. And um, she has been dealing with some like, deep, deep hip pain, um, all around her pelvis. Um, so, uh, but it was all one-sided, right? And so she, uh, she's been making good strides, um, in the right direction. We get to a point, um, where, you know, she's just finding things to be really stubborn in her hip, but she did come in with leg and some foot pain and, and you know, some, some different you know, upper back stuff too. And we're just kind of clearing out all this stuff, right? Um, but one thing was a little stubborn and she gets on, uh, she's 49, she gets on hormone uh, replacement therapy and her hip pain goes away. Um, I learned something, she learned something. So, you know, there's, there's certain things that we can't, you know, discount. Um, and maybe, you know, after some time, I would have broken through that, but, um, but the hormone therapy really worked wonders for her. Um, and so now we're working with like some really stubborn, some really stubborn toe pain that she had a surgery on. So, um, we're working with that. So, you know, it's my, my point is, is always learn. There's, you can always learn more, um, and we can just keep going deeper and deeper with this stuff. One thing is almost everybody has pain and a lot of us, we can block some of it out. Um, when you have chronic pain, it kind of filters into to the background. Um, somebody who has been having chronic pain for 20 years, they might not even really think about it that much, you know, it's there, they're aware of it, but is it something that's constantly on their minds? Not necessarily. Um, however, if this pain starts affecting, um, their mobility, um, or if somebody has been very active, um, you know, for their lives and suddenly they sprain an ankle knee, um, or have, you know, a bad hip, uh, or back injury, it sort of immobilizes you. And so when you are used to being this person that's always on the go, um, and then suddenly you can't do that, you know, what, what does that, what does that do to your, what does that do to your, uh, you know, psyche really? It's, it's pretty, uh, it can have a really strong impact. Um, 
I've had uh, a few patients that have told me that they feel like they're a prisoner in their own body. Um, it's a really, uh, you know, think about what that means, right? They're a prisoner in their own body, which means they're not able to do a lot of things that they want to do. Um, they might have had, you know, they might want to travel the world, but they can hardly walk, you know, 20 feet without suffering for it. Um, that's, you know, it's pretty real. Um, I, I find a lot of, uh, you know, people with, uh, you know, pelvic pain disorders, uh, that stuff is, is really uh, difficult to treat and it's pers it can be very persistent and uh, it can affect, you know, people's lives in a wide variety of, of ways. And, um, you know, that is one of the uh, more common things when people are feel that way, like prisoner in my own body. Um, a lot of times it's, it's, you know, some type of pelvic uh, disorder. And um, it's a lot of problem solving. <laughs> uh, but we'll get more into that later. Um, but, you know, my point is, is that, it, you know, it can make us depressed, anxious, um, you know, it can lead uh, and often, you know, it leads to substance abuse, um, you know, the opiate crisis, uh, just, you know, people who drink a bottle of wine every night just so they can sleep, you know, it's, you know, common enough. Um, and it's, uh, it is relatable when you have uh, a sudden onset of pain. Um, and I know that some people can relate and I know there's a lot of people that maybe have not gone through that um, part in their lives where they've really had something that just stops you dead in your tracks where you can't really live the life you want to um, or you have to cancel a trip, you know, uh, because you can't, you can't walk, right? Um, so that is... You know, it's it can be deeply profound how how much that affects you. Um, one thing that, just to, a note, uh, a lot of a lot of us will have patients that have this idea where we're like, uh, we have a patient that will say, "Oh, my back pain, my hip pain, my my something." It's they they start identifying with their pain as part of their persona. Um, you have to be really careful with those individuals because their pain is part of their identity. What happens if you start stripping their identity? It's a, it's, it, it ends up being pretty tough to, to work with those patients. Um, but, you know, in that case, maybe we'll start suggesting, you know, counseling or something like that to help them work, uh, you know, uh, hypnotherapy. Um, different, there's lots of stuff out there. Um, that can help with, with that, with that type of patients. Um, I've sent patients to EMDR, um, which is really, you know, a, a fascinating, um, uh, work, you know, if, if you ever, ever had that, it's, it's pretty cool stuff. Um, so acupuncture versus dry needling, um, it's all acupuncture, right? Uh, we're using an acupuncture needle. Um, as, uh, you know, Donna said earlier, I started with this work, um, as a group of acupuncture techniques. So in this post-grad course, there was eight, at least eight different, uh, acupuncture techniques that we went through. Um, and some of them were very subtle, where you're just slowly coursing chi, um, you know, very gent very gentle movements with a needle. Um, you know, there's things that would seem like, what is it, uh, cooling the mountain and, you know, um, warming techniques and things like that, right? Um, and then there is this, uh, Asher needling. Um, and I think somebody even translated it as, you know, sparrow pecking technique or something like that, you know, but anyway, it's all different 
words or different terms for acupuncture, right? Um, so, you know, PTs will sometimes uh, get upset with us calling things dry needling. We get set upset with PTs doing dry needling. Um, that's a whole other topic for a different day. Um, but, you know, what I find is I'll have a patient and they'll come in, they say, oh yeah, I've had dry needling before. Let's get to it. And I'll go, okay, great. Um, and I've learned, but a lot of times uh, patients will come in thinking that they've had this needle technique when really they've had, you know, e-stim acupuncture. Um, or sometimes it's just straight acupuncture um, with very little stimulation by, you know, and so uh, patients will come in off the street having really no idea of what trigger point release is, um, but feel fully confident that they are pros at it, right? Um, so that is something where when I have a patient that's had uh, dry needling from PETs, I ask them to describe what their experience was. Um, and if they've had acupuncture, um, you know, more like traditional acupuncture, you know, what most of us are doing in the States, um, you know, just leaving needles in for 20 minutes or do e stim acupuncture, um, I will correct, you know, that thought with the patient. I will correct that and say, look, that PT was doing acupuncture, um, very traditional acupuncture, um, as far as, you know, we're concerned, right? Now, then I will describe to them that, you know, what we're doing is going into a trigger point and you're going to really feel what I'm doing. Um, and, you know, explain to them the process. But for our um, purposes, I find that, you know, when I was, when I came to my current practice, um, that practice was really advertising uh, dry needling um, by acupuncturists, right? That um, is upsetting for some acupuncturists, it's upsetting for some PTs. Um, but what it really does is it's great for advertising, right? If you want to get people inside in your door, you know, you can say trigger point needling and some of your patients will know what that is. Um, but if you say classical acupuncture technique or usher, usher needling, um, that's not really marketable. Uh, not, not anywhere that I know of, um, maybe trigger point needling. Um, might be relatable um, or trigger point acupuncture. Some people might be able to come off the street and say, huh, okay, I think I can get, I, I think I understand what maybe what we're saying here. But, um, you know, but a lot of patients will not know what that is. Um, you know, when I first started doing this stuff, my, I, I, uh, I was practicing on different patients, you know, I was practicing on myself. And I was calling it Usher, Usher acupuncture. Um, and then one of my patients goes, oh, wow, this is dry needling. And I said, what the heck is dry needling? I had no idea. Um, and quickly, you know, I learned what dry needling is. And um, I said, oh, yeah, that's pretty much what I'm doing. And so now I'm pretty comfortable um, and I use it interchangeably. Um, but when I'm talking with my patients, um, they identify what I'm doing as dry needling. So I just call it that. And it's, you know, it's simple enough. Um, but some people do really get hung up on, on the terms. Um, but, uh, but I don't, I guess, is, is my whole point. And so I, I will use terms interchangeably um, as we go forward here. And... Um, you can make up your own mind what you want to do about it. Um, but let's see here. I find that when we start with these techniques, um, there's a lot of acupuncturists 
you know, uh, especially depending on depending on what your background is, um, where we just have a, we're just so reluctant to cause pain. Um, there is uh, a lot of times when we'll get that dachi sensation, right? That deep ache. Uh, oh, that's good. That's what we're going for. Um, you know, that's, that's a lot of times what we'll tell our patients. Um, and when we're doing this type of, uh, you know, acupuncture, it is, when we're talking duchy, it's a lot of that deep ache sensation, followed by it, a surprise. Um, and it can have a lot of, of sensation. Um, so I like to... Um, more or less inform my patients what they're going to feel or what they're likely to feel. So generally, if it's the first time, I'll say, look, it's going to be a little achy at first. Um, and then there'll be a surprise. Um, and, you know, getting used to that sensation takes some time. Some people get it right away. Um, but I would generally tell my patients that it should not be painful. Um, but there's a lot of sensation, right? Um, and depending on which area that you're working in it has different sensations. And as you work with patients, um, and as hopefully you are worked on with this, you know, if you, if you really choose to dive into this, uh, type of acupuncture, um, you know, you will really be able to understand when you're worked on or working on yourself, perhaps, um, you know, oh, wow, that spot in my leg is really, that's really sensitive to have worked on or, you know, upper back is really bad. I think different people have different areas where they prefer to not be worked on. Um, but sometimes we just have to get through um, and, and, you know, have it, different things uh, worked out because, as we do this work, um, you know, things come up and we might just be working out or walking down the street and tweak something and have to, you know, address it pretty quickly. Um, but I do find that, you know, legs are really uncomfortable. Um, it's just the muscles are just so dense there. Um, and there are some times when you'll have a patient that is just really good about, you know, getting, um, they've been on your table many times and they're used to getting all these muscle twitch, fasciculation type stuff, and they're very accustomed to it. Um, and then they might come onto your table one day and um, maybe they're having a, you know, fight with their wife or husband, uh, bad day at work, uh, maybe they just, had a close call um, in traffic um, on the way to your office. And so um, they could be really sensitive. You know, stress makes people very sensitive. Um, just, you know, could be very, uh, you know, surface level tension. Um, also hormones can play a big part of how sensitive people are. Um, and so when, even when I have uh, patients that are very accustomed to being needled, um, sometimes you just get in, you'll get two or three good releases and say, oh, that's it. Let's not do any more of that, you know? And if that's the case, we would just switch gears, you know? Uh, maybe I'll just suggest doing some acupuncture uh, or shiatsu or cupping, gua sha, whatever still want to achieve our goals um, for that patient. Um, but a lot of times it's not worth pushing our way through um, because you could just do more harm than good. And in, a lot of times if you push your patients um, through a situation like that, it's not going to be good for you or them. Um, and, you know, learning through uh, my past experiences, you could say, I'm gonna learn from that guy and not push my patients into doing something, even though I think it might be the best for them. Um, in the moment, 
they can always come back tomorrow, the next day, um, when, you know, when things are settled down, um, or maybe you can kind of work it out on, in, in the moment. Um, some sensations that we do really want to avoid though. Um, a lot of times when we're doing uh, just getting a needle in, you know, you can get a lot of stinging, burning. Um, you know, I always talk my patient, go back and forth with my patients, you know, be really clear with them um, to tell me, wow, that's really uncomfortable. Why is it uncomfortable? Um, is because sometimes that uncomfortable is just a really strong duchy. Um, and I will inform that patient that um, that that is a normal sensation. Um, and as long as they're okay with that, we'll continue. Um, but there's a lot of times when I am, when I'm needling, I'm kind of more or less probing along, looking for that trigger point. Um, and sometimes we're, when you're in one location, you can move that needle into multiple um, angles to find different different trigger points within a very small area. Um, that can be a little uncomfortable, but it really does get really great results. Um, but when you're doing that, you can sometimes hit some, you know, dendrites or axons or something that creates a spark, you know, like, wow, I just got a really weird burn sensation. Um, or stinging or something that's really biting, um, you know, that sharp stabby feelings. Um, when I have a patient telling me that, uh, I typically, I'll pull that needle out. And if I feel like I have to go back into that location, um, I'll just go maybe even, you know, a couple of, you know, millimeters off or set, you know, a quarter inch off that um, and try it from a different angle to better access that trigger point. Um, because a lot of these trigger points that we're working with, you know, it's something to be said for, it can be very precise, but there's also uh, a lot of different hand techniques that you can use to get to that area uh, and, and avoid uh, more discomfort that's than necessary. Um, but yeah, we'll talk about legs and, uh, abdominal stuff a little bit later, but it really is, uh, very uncomfortable, uh, for a lot of reasons. All right. So how does it work? This is a really, uh, tricky, uh, answer because there's not a lot of science out there on what, why this type of uh, trigger points um, needling works so profoundly. Um, you know, Janet Travell has a huge section um, in the beginning of her, uh, you know, Travell and Simmons book. Um, you know, they have, they just have a lot of, uh, science, um, or, you know, ideas of how it works, but there's, but when there, when you go through actual really looking for, uh, different clinical tests and things like that as to why and how it works, you're going to have a hard time finding things. Um, at the very end of this, uh, slideshow here, uh, at the end of your notes, there is a link to one of very few studies that I found. Um, so look at that. You know, I, I don't want to go too much into that um, because it is, you know, very dry. Um, and it's not really the point of what we're going to talk about here today. You know, I'm here to talk about technique not, you know, cell structures and axons and um, overloading axons and all this stuff. Um, but I will say that um, 
one way that it's been described to me is that you are oversensitizing, you know, a trigger point and, you know, something that's already stressed out. And when you, you're pushing it basically into a red loan, red, the red zone, right. And that, and then you have your release, your fasciculation, right. Um, to us, you know, I find that when we have these types of um, reactions, we have not only are we getting that, you know, strong chi movement, that local chi um, coursing, shall, shall we say, but when you have that deep mus muscular release, that is strongly moving blood, right? Um, there's no way that you could say that, that it's not moving blood um, because when we have that, uh, that fasciculation, it's basically pushing out all that bad blood that's locked up in the muscle and lets all this good blood come in and feed that muscle again. Not to say that the muscle isn't getting blood flow, right? It'd be necrotic if it was not getting any blood flow, but it's not as vital as we want it to be. Um, you know, when you get down into that, you know, cell, cell, cellular matrix, you know, um, you are, you know, that's the part of, of our bodies where there's a lot of exchange of not only is there a lot of nutrient in there, but there's a lot of waste in there too. And so that flows out, um, and gets processed further, you know, through our blood work, through our lymph, all this stuff, right? Um, when there's a lot of stagnation in a particular muscle or muscle group area, um, you're gonna that that matrix is just gonna be full of waste, basically, you know, because like your cells in your body, uh, like big picture, right? We have to we have to eat to get nutrition and we have to poop out the bad stuff. Right. Um, and you know, as as big as a small and down to the cellular level. And so when you have in a, a muscle group, all this gunky stuff, you know, all this waste, basically, um, you, you get, you get that fasciculation and pushes all that stuff out and lets good, you know, nutrition, blood, oxygen, to come in and that um, is what rehabilitates the muscle um, to basically get, you know, deeper healing. That is, you know, more or less what I believe. Um, and again, the science is a little tricky on that. Um, it, it's not really clear. Um, now, when we have, uh, you know, the, our whole body is wrapped in fascia, right? Everything, um, there is there's this, you know, uh, connective tissue that connects every single piece of our body. Um, and that's all made up basically of collagen, right? And so, you know, that is, it's something that does not it's not something that's going to move um, like a muscle will, but if you have a lot of muscles that are tight along a line, say, it's going to create a pulling on the fascial body. Um, and that is what distills down into causing different pain patterns. Um, and so we'll, we're going to get more into that as we go further. Um, but it's something that, you know, you have to always be kind of thinking of as a big picture, right? Um, because you have local muscle that you, that we're working with. And then we have to look at the longer fascial lines of the body um, where, you know, something in, you know, your low back or hip can affect, you know, a neck um, or mid back or something like that. Um, making sure we're covering everything that I want to here. Um, so, but yeah, looking at the big picture is, is really important when we're, when we're engaging with people here. Um, 
weakness versus tension. So when we have um, a patient that is in some type of pain, though, and a lot of our patients are going to physical therapy, um, and the physical therapist will say, well, you're weak here and there, and we're gonna build you up, um, build up your muscle, muscle strength in this said area, right? And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I think that's, it's all good and sound. Um, but a lot of times what I do, you know, try to tell my patients again is that, you know, because of, uh, because of a muscle strain, um, the muscle strain itself is gonna start, is going to cause that weakness, right? So, and what I mean is that a normal muscle, you know, when, when a muscle fires, it should be going, you know, as far as, you know, uh, strength goes, zero to 100, whatever your strength is as a person, right, as an individual, because that's very individualistic there, your muscles should go zero to 100. But if you have a muscle strain that's causing, you know, uh, that muscle to only get 40% or 60% of its range of use or strength, then that is going to cause weakness or that sense of weakness. So when we rehabilitate those muscles, we basically give that muscle its full range back. So kind of getting these trigger point releases, you'll get that zero to hundred again, um, you know, because you want that, you know, you want things to fire. Um, and sometimes, you know, of course <laughs> we all have, we need to have smooth movements too, but, but that is, you know, that is the difference between to me, you know, having that weakness and strength. Um, and it's not always just as simple as that, of course, you know, there's, there's a lot of different um, uh, situations where that can cause that weakness, but uh, but more often than not, I find that it's just that that muscle strain um, is that muscle is not integrating into the muscle group as well uh, because of because it has trigger points, you know, and that's what we're that's what we're after. Staying hydrated. All right. Who can be needles? This is a fun one. Um, I would say almost anybody can be needled as long as they tolerate it well. Um, but not everybody tolerates it well. Um, I have a wide range of, of patients. Um, and <laughs> from very athletic people to people that are, you know, just not athletic at all. Um, but I would say that almost anybody can be needled. Um, some people are really just hypersensitive to it and they just can't tolerate it. And um, it just takes, it takes some time to pick those people out. Um, and some people will get on board with it. Um, and the, that's the reason why at the very beginning steps of this stuff, I like to go very slowly. Um, I'm not rushing, I'm not pushing somebody into have trigger point release on their first visit, unless they come specifically for that. However, I have a lot of patients that will come in um, with pain thinking they're gonna get acupuncture, I'll do acupuncture on them, of course, um, and kind of get things to smooth out. And then I'm gonna say, well, look, I found a few trigger points um, in this area that's giving you a hard time. So I'm gonna walk you through some, some dry needling and um, see how you do with it. We're gonna go very slowly and just kind of walk them through the process. And some people are like, please, please never do that to me ever again, or I'll hate you. <laughs> and then some people are kind of on the fence about it. Maybe we'll try it again next time they come in. Um, and uh, some people are just like, wow, this is exactly what I need. Um, and I know it. And let's do as much as we can of this today. Um, and, you know, um, that that is a wonderful thing because those patients, if they respond really well and they're very comfortable with it, they will, um, they'll get better pretty quickly, tends to be. Um, now, pediatrics. So I had uh, 
you know, I do treat uh, most, most peds that I have uh, tends to be less pain. Um, it's more, you know, uh, digestive related things or um, ADHD, that type of stuff, right? Um, but what I do find is that the world that we're living in now, um, even, you know, junior high, they're pushing these kids to be athletes. You know, there's very little time for schoolwork because they're, they're working on whatever sport that they have. Um, I had a 12 year old, um, he was really serious about his tennis game and uh, apparently he was really good at it, you know, really good for him. And he, uh, he tweaked his, uh, arm, you know, he, he had like a tennis elbow thing happening and it went, uh, it crept, you know, back, you know, it was sort of like a tennis elbow thing, but it crept up, you know, basically the back of his arm into the top of, you know, his shoulder, um, and a little bit into his neck. And, uh, he was really funny because he was really, he really wanted to, he was excited to try acupuncture and then, you know, he, he was all about the Google. So he was looking all this stuff up and he's really excited that I did dry needling too. And so, you know, so I was just surprised at how it, excited he was to be needled. Um, so I took a smaller needle than I would, uh, more, you know, than I would an adult patient and worked very slowly with him. Um, and he did great with it. Um, but tip, but more often than not, your peds are not going to want to deal with it because they don't want to deal with needles in general because needles are scary, right? Most adults don't want to deal with needles either because needles are scary. But, um, but that's an example of, you know, you can, you can, you know, treat younger folks, you know, if they're, I don't, you know, 12 is, is as young as I've needled. I don't know if that I, I would needle somebody that, uh, is younger than that at that point. I don't know. Um, but I always take it, of course, case by case, um, elderly is another thing where, you know, it depends on the person. Um, I have, you know, some uh, elderly patients, let's say 70s, early 80s. Um, I've even had uh, early 90s that I've needled. Um, but these patients are, you know, very active. Um, they're not sitting at home drinking tea in their rocking chair, you know, as some older people might do. Um, but they're out there, they're, you know, doing yoga, they're doing dance, they're going for walks every day. You know, some of them are more active than I, than I am. And, uh, you know, I wish I had the time for all that. Um, but, uh, a lot of times with elderly, um, patients is, you know, you have to think of, the uh, elasticity within their bodies, right? Um, especially if you're working in their upper body, um, because you don't want to, you, you don't want a pneumothorax. Um, nobody wants to deal with that, obviously. And so, you know, you just have to be really thoughtful about those patients. Um, so, so keep that in mind. Pregnancy don't do it. You know, uh, I, uh, you know, over the, over the years, I have needled a couple of women, um, that were suffering from migraine. Um, and they were, you know, uh, deep, you know, they're in their third trimester when I was doing this, right. You know, uh, first trimester, Definitely not. Uh, but I would say just don't even mess with it. You know, I, I really just don't, I don't um, do needling on, it's just a lot of, um, it's a lot of sensation. And so I usually will just encourage them to do acupuncture, massage techniques, cupping, gua sha, all that type of stuff. Um, 
it's way safer. Um, you know, if it's, if maybe if it's in their last couple of weeks, but I, you know, I, I would just say avoid it, um, because we don't need, um, we don't need to do harm to, to that situation. You know, um, we don't need that overstimulation. <clears throat> so constitution, general health, obviously, um, I find that, you know, uh, you can have, you know, all different types of people can do really well with, with this type of work. Um, but you just have to start slowly. You know? um, I do have a lot of people, you know, that are, let's say, 30s to 60s um, that are, you know, especially once we get into our 40s and 50s, you know, we're going to start really pushing our bodies to stay in shape. Um, and when we're really trying to stay healthy and at that age, um, it's really easy for us to just have a little mistake, you know, um, or, you know, there's maybe some sports that we didn't, you know, high school into our 20s. And when we're, you know, 40s and we're kind of bring it with that same type of vigor that we had in our 20s, um, it's really easy to, you know, have some injuries and, and mess ourselves up. Um, so, uh, but you never know. Sometimes uh, I had I had this one patient. He uh, he's a bigger guy, and he had hip pain for four or five years, something like that. Um, and he came in and I really didn't think that he was going to do well. Um, and I thought it was going to take a lot of time. And, uh, I got after two visits, um, he got better and he was like, <laughs> I heard from a friend of his that, you know, that comes to me more regularly that he was out in Japan doing all this hiking out there. And I was like, that amazing, you know, after two, three visits, um, to have that stubborn hip pain just go away. Um, now the thing with your, you know, deficient hypersensitive patients is, you know, go slow. Um, don't do a lot of needling on them. Um, or, you know, uh, I will start with acupuncture, um, you know, regulates what's happening a little bit best, best we can. Um, maybe needle a spot or two, and then perhaps we'll do some oxybustion on them. Um, um, or some, you know, if, if you're privy to this, doing some, you know, like Qigong type massage techniques, that type of stuff um, is really great with those deficient patients. Um, you can get a lot of great results just doing, you know, very, very, uh, you know, more or less coursing things with them. Um, can be really powerful. And the intensity of needle needling can be controlled in most situations. Um, it just takes time to figure out what, what that means. Um, and that can be that can be different for everyone. Okay. So it's a little pick up from Google here. So, you know. Trigger points, discrete focal hyper irritable spots located in the top band of muscle. Spots are painful on compression and can, be, and can produce referred pain, referred tenderness, motor dysfunction, and autonomic phenomena. Okay. Interesting. We're not too surprised about those things. Um, and, uh, We've all seen the uh, trigger point patterns, you know, where where the you know uh, from the Travell Simmons books, where they have the X with all the red referral pain stuff. Um, that is all, um, you know. We don't have to explain too much of that stuff. We all know that uh, motor dysfunction. You know, that's that can be kind of uh, back into sometimes a weakness. Um, sometimes you'll have patients where 
they can't uh, they can't pick up their coffee cup in the morning because they have you know so many trigger points in their arm that they don't have smooth movements. So they it's you know they don't have strength. Um, autonomic phenomena. That's a that's an interesting one. Um, I look at that again. There's there's a lot of like pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, that's where I see most of that autonomic phenomena. Um, cause you can have, you know, uh, different types of, um, you know, you could have different urinary problems, bladder control problems, um, erectile dysfunction for sure. Um, and a lot of different neuropathies can also come from, uh, pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, a lot of times, uh, you know, women and men can have different sensations, but very strong sensations in their sexual organs. Um, and, you know, this type of work can really can do a lot for them. Um, another autonomic phenomena <clears throat> that I've seen was I had this patient who uh, she had an airbag. Um, she had a very minor car accident, but her airbag smashed her face, right? And then she wasn't able to, her eyes stopped producing tears. Um, it's bizarre, you know? So she is constantly with the eye drops and things like that. Um, and so I tried some really, uh, I thought, I thought doing a really basic like meridian therapy type work with her, I thought that would be really powerful. And it didn't do anything. Um, and I, you know, I gave that two, three shots and I said, well, you know what, let's try something different. And so I started needling, um, areas in her occipital. Um, and, um, I hit some spots, you know, like basically got into her temples and, um, got some pretty good results. Um, and over the course of time, we did a lot of spots, you know, like on her, you know, you know, all these muscles in the scalp, um, some things around her eyes, you know, um, kind of all around her jaw. And over time, um, she got better and it was pretty cool. Um, and that was a, uh, learning experience too. I, you know, it's not, it's not too many people that want you know, all that needling in there. So, you know, Chinese medicine, we have many ways of, of defining pain. Um, more often, it's going to be trauma, right? Blood stasis, chi, stagnation. Uh, that's all, you know, very straightforward for us. Um, and there's lots of different techniques that we've learned that we've used over the years for this stuff. So, you know, I, I'm not going to find a lot of, you know, we're, I'm not going to go into this in depth. Um, you know, but I would, I would say that most patients coming in, it's going to be some type of trauma or muscle strain, um, basically, um, and that may come from trauma. It may not, um, you know, environmental influences, things like that. Um, that is something that it can sometimes be a mixed bag. Um, because if you have an environmental influence, um, cold, right? Uh, let's use that, a uh, cold damp. Um, a lot of times that's going to attack our areas of weakness, right? So um, because there could be some trigger points in that area, you know, that is sometimes, you know, worth considering, you know, to do beyond just you know, maybe some warming techniques and herbal medicine that warm their bodies and, you know, clear out the damp and that stagnation. Um, you know, doing a little of this and that is, you know, the best thing, but you have to uh, figure out the best thing for those patients. Um, I have a uh, patient, she's kind of like a, uh, you know, long haul COVID and she has, um, she came in with very heavy legs, brain fog, um, just heavy body, um, very poor appetite, tons of bloating, you know, so you're like, okay, cold, damp. Um, and she also had a desk job, 
Um, so she was, you know, she's like this all the time. So she was a mixed bag, right? You know, I gave her, um, I, I tried a couple of different herbal formulas with her. She worked really well uh, with Long Tong and um, doing Meridian style acupuncture. Um, and at, after a few visits, you know, we started just really targeting um, the trigger point stuff. So really, you know, hitting her traps, levator, um, getting that stuff to clear out. And she did really well with it. Um, and, you know, the thing is, is we have to be really dynamic as, you know, practitioners. We have to be very, uh, we have to be on our toes. Um, you have to discern what your patient needs within the best of your ability, right? Um, and, you know, if you're not sure, you just problem solve it. You go one step at a time. How do trigger points develop? Okay. So, you know, trauma is really the thing, right? Auto accidents, slip and falls, you know, depending on where you live right now, there's leaves falling everywhere. I've had, I've had a, uh, three people in the past week have, uh, accidents from slipping on leaves or clearing leaves off their roof, um, slipping off their ladders and things like that. Um, so those get, you know, pretty interesting. We have VA patients, um, those, uh, you know, those individuals, they can have all different types of, um, of trauma, obviously. And oddly enough, I have a lot of VA patients that will have injuries from basic training because basic training, they might not be fit at all. And now they're being made to run long distances with, you know, 40 pounds on their back um, and do all these weird movements that their body's not used to. <clears throat> and they could have, you know, enduring pain because of the, because of these situations. Um, so, so that's definitely, um, you know, a major thing again, sports, um, you know, a lot of times, uh, I can have a patient in their thirties and they'll be like, gosh, I don't know, you know, where this came from. Um, uh, where, where did this back back pain come from and, you know, or, or shoulder pain. Um, and, uh, you know, it, a lot of times it's when you're younger and you're really pushing your body, um, to perform, right. You're going to develop trigger points, um, over time. Now, when we're young, our blood is vital, right? We have, you know, we're strong, um, we have a lot of elasticity in our bodies, but as we age, of course, that's gonna, that's gonna wane. And so when we are of the age, when we're, you know, strong and vibrant and elastic, um, we can still develop these trigger points and have them not really catch up with us until we are, um, you know, helping somebody move a desk, you know, move, helping somebody move furniture, or, you know, uh, I often bizarrely, you know, it'll be, you know, some guy picking up a box of cereal off the, you know, off the ground for his kids or something like that, you know? Um, and then ooh, I can't stand up straight anymore. Uh, they tweak their back, you know, but, but how would that happen? Um, for just a, such a simple movement, it wasn't that simple movement, right? It was, what led up to that? Um, and maybe it was, maybe they're doing a bunch of deadlifts the week before. Um, or maybe they're playing, you know, some full contact sports, you know, playing hockey or football when they're younger. You know, it's, it's really difficult to say what that, you know, trigger was um, that made them their back seize or, you know, what, whatever that pattern started. But a lot of it is, you know, that type of, you know, I, I, I think it's a worthy consideration. Um, you know, baseball players, a lot of times they'll come in with shoulder pain um, if they played, you know, high school baseball or softball, right? Um, obviously, overuse, um, posture is huge. So, you know, um, some people just don't hold their bodies up very well. 
Um, it's a struggle for many people. Um, and what I tell people uh, is, you know, just really pay attention. Um, it's really easy for a lot of us to be, you know, even, you know, as at an acupuncture office and you're working, you have, have patients all day long, you know, you're on your seventh, eighth hour and um, you've had a stressful day. Your, <laughs> your uh, posture might start getting pretty poor. You know, we get tired, we get lazy. Um, but these types of things, you know, it's, yeah, it could be worth setting timers, right? I tell my patients sometimes set a timer every 30 minutes or an hour to check in, take a deep breath, um, check your posture, you know, like tuck in your, tuck in your neck, you know, straighten your spine, drop your shoulders, um, observe what, where you're holding tension. Um, so, so that's important. Um, bed and pillows, you know, it's, it's tough finding a good pillow, right? Um, you can spend hundreds of dollars finding, trying to find the right pillow or bed for that matter. You know, this, that's a, it's kind of a big deal. Um, some more difficult situations um, are, you know, old injuries, people will comp get compensation um, in their bodies um, and, you know, could come from how they hold themselves, how they walk. Um, and then you can have structural uh, structural anomalies, right? Um, these are wide ranging, um, very wide ranging. And, you know, sometimes it's just like a bone spur or something like that. Um, sometimes it can be uh, hardware screws, things like that, that are, you know, in the body. Um, and we are not going to be able to really fix that if you will, but, but we can help, um, we can help these patients, um, with some of these, some of these problems. And I always say, if you start up next to a, a CrossFit, you know, you got those, those, those people are messing their bodies up pretty regularly. Um, but nothing against CrossFit, right? Um, but yeah, you could do really well by that um i often have a lot of patients that will you know they're they have this kyphosis right because they're they're constantly looking at their computer they're they're you know sticking their necks out um that ends up being a problem that's you know it's difficult to treat because the natural curvature in their neck starts to change um, over time, right? Because there's a, there is, there is a curvature in our neck that you know, we're basically born with. Um, and protecting that is very important, right? And the best you can do is you know, maintaining um, good posture and, and that keeping that awareness. Um, but, you know, what happens when you've had somebody who, you know, they did a whole master's degree. So, you know, they're in the books, they're in the computer for years. Um, and then they get into a job where they're working 60 something hours a week, again, on a computer all day long. And over time, that's either gonna, gonna make their neck straight or create curvature going like the wrong way. Right. Um, oftentimes when that happens, I will, uh, refer out, um, I'll send my patients. There's some, there's some chiropractors that, um, that I found that that's the exactly what they do. Their, uh, whole job or, you know, their purpose really is to help create good curvature back in the neck again. Um, now, when you're working with those patients, because they should definitely be seeing you as well, um, but you'll find that, you know, when you're getting all these great trigger point releases in their neck, you know, they're going to, um, they're going to feel great for a few days and like, oh, wow, all this stuff is so loose. I love, I love, you know, have feeling that, you know, 
getting all my range of motion back and all that stuff, right? I feel good. Um, five days later, you know, they're locked up again. Um, and, you know, if that person's been coming to me for, you know, six weeks or, you know, more, I'm just at that point, I'm saying, uh, you know, look, you should, you should start uh, at least get an x-ray of your neck to check the curvature um, and really start looking into that. Um, and uh, that way we'll be able to get a deeper result from our dry needling and um, really be able to change um, and get, you know, really the goal is to get these people to fully rehabilitate. Um, I don't want somebody to be in this endless cycle where they come, they have to see you once a week forever. Um, I have some patients that need that where they, um, they're really just waiting to get uh, surgery, right? Um, there's some people where you're just not going to be able to fix, right? But there is a lot of good that we can do for a lot of people just to help them maintain themselves, to help get through them through the week. Um, because uh, some, yeah, you, sometimes the structural things, you know, we just cannot fix, but the body, as much as we try to work that situation, the body is still going to try to compensate and try to, you know, um, keep, keep going and keep surviving because that's what our bodies are made for, you know, just to keep going and keep moving. Um, well, but on that note, we're going to take a, a little 15 minute break and uh, stretch our legs, grab some water, and we'll be back in a little bit. Take a look at this. Thank you, Mike. We'll thank be you. back in 15 minutes. Okay, thank you. Okay, that will be at 10.30 Pacific time. <laughs> 